I'm so glad the Lord is in control of our life. Man. I tried to illustrate to our young people and children today about through, by use of a remote control. We have a remote for everything. You know that? I was thinking about it. Our, we have a remote for I have a remote for an alarm clock that sits right beside my bed, but I have a remote. That's so I don't have to do this. I just have to do this. Yeah. I mean, I have a remote for, they have remotes for ceiling fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're so lazy, we don't even get out of the chair and pull the chain anymore. (laughs) Got a remote for that, right? I was going through my office the other day, and I found two remotes. I don't even know what they go to. I'm afraid to push a button. I'm afraid. I don't know what might happen. You know? I might push the button, and who knows? we got a, got a remote to start our car. Yeah, right. Now, how cool is that? Right. A remote to start your car. Right. Man, it's amazing. we got a remote for we want, we want to have, we like having those remote controls. Like to have them just sit there and, right? You ever, men, if you ever get a remote control, men like, there's, there's something about having a remote control in your hand. You feel like you are in control. <laughs> you feel like you are. You'll sit there and you can, man, you can do whatever you want to do with that remote control, right? And I'm glad, I'm glad that God is in control of my life. Amen. That God, not that God has a remote control on my life, amen, but I'm glad that he is in control of my life. He's in control of everything about my life today. Hallelujah. He looks down on me. He sees me. He knows who I am. He knows what I'm going through, and he's in control today. Wow. And sometimes some people say, well, if God's in control, why would he allow for that lady to jump the curb and and hit those kids. Why would he allow that? If something like that ever, never happened in our life, we would never know the goodness of God and the protection of That's God. Truth. That's Amen. right. We would never know that God is there to protect Amen. us and right. to shelter us. That's right. But when we get those close calls like that, it just reminds it us. Reminds us. Helps us just stop and think. Helps us stop and realize right. God is in control of my yeah. life. And God is in control right. of all things. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles. Praise book first book of Matthew, and then we'll also be looking in the book of Luke. Some common verses to you when we turn to the Gospels. Most of these verses are, are fairly common to us in the Gospels, and these Gospel stories are are rel- we're relatively familiar with them, and uh, but I want to share something with you. I've just had on my my heart over the last week or so just this topic: the last days. The last days. I think we're living in the last days. I think we're living in the last days. And I guess uh, maybe maybe it has something to do with you know the end of the world's coming. I didn't know if you didn't know that you need to you know read your newspaper. Because that's all they're talking about, 12, 21, you know, it's going to be the end of the world. And um, some people say 12, 12, 12, that sounds pretty, you know, drastic too, don't it? But they say 12, 21 because of my Mayan calendar or whatever. So the end of the world's coming, and hope you're prepared for that. But if you're not, I'm sure they have books in the library. Uh, end of the world for dummies, I think they got that one there. Um got a, a lot of good books there so right sister, sister jackson do they have into the world for dummies the, okay why well, check that out okay because i think check it out check it out and check it out okay but i if if they don't have it i might write it okay i might write that i think that i think i would that would be a big seller into the world for dummies and um, but anyway but i've been thinking about the last days and when we think about the last days, the coming of the Lord, uh, drawing so near, right? So near. Look at the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins that took their lamps 
went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. I want you to notice that the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Man, they came back, the door was shut. The door was shut. I think that when you read that, where they say, uh, Lord, Lord, open to us, it implies there that they were knocking on the door. They were knocking on the door. Okay? If you look in the book of uh, Luke, chapter 13, verse 23 is where I'll begin reading. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And, ye shall, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have, we have eaten and drink. And, and, and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. You yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God, and behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. And I think when we, when we read these verses here, and I think when you read Matthew chapter 25, you realize the Lord is talking about the last days. In Matthew chapter 25, he's talking about those, those final hours. Of course, Matthew chapter 24, and right around that, in the context, it's talking about the final moments of time, and and the last days, and what they should be looking for, what some signs of those times, and so forth. And I think when we read that, we read that about the, the uh, ten virgins, we understand that, that the Lord is talking about these last days. We're living in the final moments of time, I believe. Now, we've, we, can, we, can, we can fuss about, you know, uh, whether or not the Lord's coming in the next year, next month, next ten years, whatever. But I think we're in the whole scheme of things, we have to know, we have to know that there is mu not much time left before the Lord returns. And we maybe we'll get a chance as, as we continue to think about the last days to think, look more at those signs of our times. But I want to focus right here tonight is that we are living in these final moments. The clock is ticking. The clock is, is passing. We are, the time is swiftly going by. And we are, going to be, uh, we are going to be seeing the Lord return. And I think we're living in those last moments. But what I want to talk to you about tonight is knocking at the door of heaven. Knocking at the door of heaven. These people, all of them, had reason to believe that they should be allowed to enter. They all thought that they had a right to be entered into the feast, and into the marriage. They all thought that they should have a right. But when, when you look in the book of Luke, here they come, they're knocking on the door. And they're saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Lord, open the door. Let us in. They're knocking at the door. And the Lord says, depart. Depart. I don't, I don't even know who you are. 
I don't even know, know who you are. Then they go into uh, the, their defense, telling him, Lord, we, we ate with you. We drank with you. We, we, you taught in our streets. Lord, we are familiar with you. We are familiar with you. We know your teaching. We have had fellowship with you. We have had communion with you, Lord. You should know, you, Lord, you got to know us. Open up the door and let us in. But the Lord refused to let them. And as they turn away from the door, picture in your mind, as they turn away from the door, they look into the window and they see all of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of the Gentiles and all the people there that are sitting around the table, but they are excluded and they are on the outside. The door shut. The door closed. These people, you know, when you look at the, the five foolish virgins, they, should, they thought they should have had a right to be there. They had, all, they had on their wedding garment. They had prepared. They had come just like the wise had come. Only thing was they just were not ready when the, when the time came. They weren't prepared when the time came. For whatever reason, maybe they thought, you know, it's not going to be that long. So they didn't feel like, we don't need to prepare for any long, extended, drawn-out affair here. The Lord is coming, and so we, need, we just take what we have in our lamps, and we'll be ready when the Lord comes. We'll be ready when the Lord comes. Some probably think, you know, because I had fellowship, because I had a communion with God, because I know His Word, I know the Bible, I've been around His teachings. Hey Amen. I have been taught by the preacher the, or the man of God. I know it. I should be ready to meet the Lord. And when the Lord comes, I'll be ready. But the sad thing is there are going to be a lot of people that expect to go in the rapture and to meet the Lord, and they are not ready to go and meet the Lord. George Barna, he does a lot of the research, you know, Christian research, and, and uh, in his book, he says 41%, and I feel like that is a low number, but he said 41% of the people that are in church today, in church today, do not even claim to be saved, have never had an experience of salvation in their life, 41%, I think that's rather low, but even at that, think about it. That's almost one out of two people. One out of two people that, that th that's in a church. That's in a church that's not ready to meet the Lord. That's not ready if the Lord comes. That's kind of, that's kind of frightening, isn't it? Look out over our church. Look at the person sitting next to you. Either they're going or you're not, one of the two, okay? You're not, or they are, or they're not, and you are, one of the two. So, you can, I'll leave you to figure that out, okay? But I mean, think about that. If there's, and even in our churches, you say, well, Brother David, that's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, mega churches and nominal churches that's involved in that, and their number uh, affects that greatly, and you're right, I hope. You're right, I hope. But the fact is, to think that we could be right here today, right here, and be so close that we could reach out and knock on the door of heaven. That we could even knock at the door of heaven and yet still not be included. To think that we could be here so near, have come so far, have come so close to the end, but yet here we are so close, and yet we, yet we would be left out. God help us not to, be, not to miss what God is getting ready to do. Amen. Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be ready, Lord. I don't want to just be in a church, have a fellowship, have a communion. But I want to know the Lord. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm ready to meet the Lord. Amen. I'm ready to meet God. Amen. This is what we live for. This is, what we, this is what we are all about, is the coming of the Lord. But I think many times because the Lord delays His coming, complacency sets in. If when, the, if when the ten virgins had arrived, all of them prepared, 
all of them with lamps burning, all of them ready to go, oil in the lamp, we're ready to do it. If the Lord would have come at that moment, if the, if the bridegroom would have shown up at right then, if they'd only tarried for a short time, if he had only tarried for a little while, if he had have come before they fell asleep, if he would have come before they slumbered and slept, maybe the story would read different. If the Lord would have come 10 years ago, maybe it would be different for some. Maybe if he had come the day after you got saved, it would have been different for you. Maybe if the Lord would have come, amen, one year after you got saved, maybe it would be different from you, for you. But if the Lord tarries, what happens is they begin to get complacent. Complacency begins to settle in. And the next thing you know, they're all drifting off to sleep. And how many times in our, in our walk with God does complacency begin to sit in in our life? And we begin to get comfortable where we are at. And we begin to get, feel like that we have a reservation. And we feel like that we have special, a special place uh, set aside next to the Lord, you know. And that we're going to be right there at His right hand. And so that we, we're just, everything's good. And so we begin to fall into a state of complacency. Where once we were striving, that's the word that was used in the book of Luke. Amen, 13 and 24, I believe it was. He said, strive to enter in. Strive to enter in. Remember when you were striving for God? Remember when you were fighting for your salvation? Remember when you were doing everything that you could just to stay saved? Yeah, you know... Uh, Peace, peace creates weak links. Do you understand what I'm saying? Peace creates cowards. Peace makes us weak. But when we are striving, when we are fighting, we make ourselves strong. Amen? When you're fighting, when, you're, when, there, when you have an enemy that you're fighting against, you stay strong. You do all you have to do to defend yourself. You do all that you have to do to protect yourself. But when we get to a point where we feel like that we no longer, that, we're, that we've arrived and that we're no longer striving for our salvation... When we are no longer, amen, fighting and, and battling. You say, but man, that, that's, a, that's a sign of a, of a weak Christian when they always have to fight to be saved. I tell you what, if you have to fight to stay saved, you'll be reading your Bible, you'll be praying, you'll be seeking God, you'll be going to church, you'll be doing all you can, amen, because you want to win the battle. What scares me is those people that feel like they don't have to fight anymore. They don't have to fight anymore. They think they've got it all down. They think they've got it all sewed up. Everything is fine. I know my Bible. I know how to have church. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. Amen. And they are not striving to enter in. They have grown complacent. They have grown complacent in their walk with God. How many of us find ourselves in that position? How many of us find ourselves there saying, you know, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Not sure about them, but I'm going to make it. I'm not sure about them, but I'm going to make it. I'm not sure about my brother. I'm not sure about my sister. I'm not sure about everybody else, but I'm going to make it. And we fall into this state of complacency. To a state of complacency. Lord, help us. Some people's relying on the fact that they have had communion with God. Some are relying on the fact that they have had fellowship with God at one time. Lord, I go to church. I go to church. I know you go to church. But just because you're sitting on a church pew don't mean you're ready to meet the Lord. Just because you're here does not mean you're ready to be. You can sit in a church house. And what did what was the problem that God had? Hey man, with the churches? Hey man, when you look, they had left their first love. What happened? They got complacent. 
They got complacent. And God said, you know what? You better, you better change your ways. You better repent. You better do your first works over. You better get back to where you're striving because your complacency has made you leave your first love. What do you say? He says, hey, you're not cold. You're not hot. You're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I must spew you out of my mouth. Amen. Why? Because complacency is what makes us lukewarm. Yeah. God help us to realize that just because you've been at, got a ticket to Bethel Chapel don't mean you got a ticket to heaven. Amen. Just because you're sitting here today don't mean that you're, you know, you can say, man, I know, I know the teaching. I know the Word of God. I've been, around, I've been around the Word of God. I've been in Sunday school all my life. I know my Bible. There's going to be a lot of people that go to hell that know their Bible. There's going to be a lot of people that go to hell that can quote more verses than you do. That's right. Can't say knowing your Bible saves you. Can't say going to Sunday school all your life saves you. You may be able to quote chapter and verse. You may be able to know all the stories in the Bible. You may have heard the teachings. There may be, you may say, I have heard all the sermons. I have heard them, and I, I just know when they pull a text out, I already know what they're going to preach. I know all their points. I know all that. Listen, you're, you're, you're amazing. You are amazing, all right? But that don't mean you're saved. That don't mean you're ready to meet God. Teaching in Sunday school. You can say, well, no, I've not just been in Sunday school. I have taught Sunday school. Whoopee, every other one. Whoopee. Whoopee. I mean, it really don't, it don't matter, does it? It really does not matter how, how long you taught Sunday school. Don't matter how long you pastored. Don't matter how many sermons you preach. It don't matter how many times you've revivals you've held. How many people have even got saved when you preached. It doesn't matter. Hey man, we can all get into a place of complacency and not be ready to meet God. We're knocking at the door of heaven. We're knocking at the door of heaven. Complacency. Laziness. Hey, look, just a couple things that'll be done, okay? Complacency. When you become complacent, you lack reach. You no longer reach for others. You no longer are trying to get other people saved. You no longer have a burden for other people. I'm not about a burden for other souls. How many people sit in a church building and they, you, if you ask them, and we won't ask this question tonight, okay? But if you ask them, how many people did you lead the Lord in the last year? They would hang their head and be embarrassed. How many people did you reach for God? How many people did you bring to Christ? How many people did you reach out? Well, the Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. And what happens is it leads to complacency in our life. Well, the Lord is going to return. The Lord is going to return. And we, we're not doing anything to reach the lost. We're not doing anybody, anything to go out and win anybody to Christ. Well, there's no need to send another missionary. The Lord's coming soon. There's no need to start another church. Amen. They've had their church. Amen. There's no need to start another church. The Lord's going to come. The Lord's going to come before you even get a building built. The Lord's going to come before you can even get a preacher there. The Lord's going to come. And we, if we live that way, we will never reach for anybody for Christ. But that's complacent people. That's complacent people. I believe what God wants us to do, amen, is to be striving. To be striving, not only to keep ourselves safe, but to reach all those that we can. To reach everyone. And if there's a burning building and there's a hundred people in there, are you satisfied to save 99? And let one of them burn? Are you, are you satisfied, amen, to save all but just one of them? Amen, I would say you'd want to save as many as all, or all of them if you could. 
If you had time, you'd want to save them all. Amen. And those that are not complacent, they strive to reach the lost for God. If you don't have a burden for the lost, I want you to know I feel like you probably have grown complacent. If you're not trying to win to them. Today I had to, I had to run into Walmart and um, I ran into Sister Veach at Walmart. And I, when I say I ran into Sister Veach, I really mean I ran into Sister Veach. Okay, she was coming around the corner, turning into the aisle. I was coming out. Okay, she's in good health. Her heart held up real well. Okay, and she she did fine. But oh man, she was tough. She said, I got to tell somebody about Jesus, and she started telling me about all the ones in the store that she had been witnessing to, while she had been in Walmart. Okay, and then she started witnessing to me, and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm a I'm all right here. She was telling, wanting to tell everybody about Jesus. She was all fired up, all excited, and she had been going through the store, hey amen, telling everybody that she had come in contact, I guess, hey amen, about, about the Lord Jesus, hey amen. I'm glad to see that saints of God don't ever have to get complacent, but we always can be striving to reach one more for the Lord, one more for God. Man. And saints that are not complacent, they are striving. Man, they are reaching. They are reaching. Man, but saints that are not complacent have revival as well. Have revival. When you look at what, when you look at these scriptures, I mean, I think the one thing that stands out to me is that some of them had oil, some of them did not. Some of them were prepared, some of them were not. It's not good enough just to say you went to church. I mean, you need to have revival in your soul. You need to have a, I'm, I like to see people that don't matter how long they've been saved, they're still in a spirit of revival. Yeah, amen. Hey man, when everybody else is coming to church and they're sitting there looking at the preacher and they're about ready to fall out of the pew and, and they're yawning so big, oh, you guys don't realize how big you can yawn sometimes. And they, they are, they're, you know, some of them even get the stretch going on sometimes if they sit and well, some of them don't sit all the way to the back. But some of them get the stretch going on. And, I mean, they're really... And then there are some people that always have revival. Always have a spirit of revival in their heart. Amen. That's the kind of Christian. Amen. That won't grow complacent when they have a revival burning in your heart. Amen. Church, I don't ever want to get to the point that, well, the Lord's coming. Amen. We're just going to settle in here and keep ourselves and be ready when the Lord comes. I want to have a revival. While I'm waiting for the Lord to come. Yeah. I want to be revived when the Lord comes. Wow. Amen? Amen? I don't want the Lord to have to carry me in to the do through the door on a stretcher. Amen? I want to go rejoicing through the door. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise and But so many times we grow complacent while we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. Here, here we are, church. Every one of you could knock on the door of heaven right now. You, could re you, you are close enough, you could knock at the door of heaven. And wouldn't it be sad to think that we would be this close, this close, and not, and not be able to make it? Not be able to make it. We're living in the last days. And I feel like we're living in a, a time of complacency in the church. Complacency in the church, it's a time for us to do all we can. All we can. To have a revival. Have a move. Yeah. Oh, are we having a revival again, Brother David? Are we, can, are you going all the way through Sunday? Really? Is that how many nights? Five nights? When are you having that again? That's one of my ten weeks of vacation. That's, that's when we've planned our annual trip to Disney World. But you can't do it the next week because that's when we've planned our cruise. And you can't do it the next week because that's when Silver Dollar City. Come on. Oh, come on, you can't do it in September. That's Gospel Fest. Come on. Revival's not here in Bethel Chapel. It's in the city, man. That's where they're having revival. Uh, hey, oh, God help us. 
recommend that we don't get settled into complacency, right? But that we seek revival, we seek souls, we're striving, we're striving. Have I arrived yet? I haven't arrived, so I must strive. Amen, I've got to strive to make it. Amen. There's a verse that's been on my mind. Man, and uh, the kingdom of God suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. Sounds pretty rough, don't it? That's right, it is. It is. Yeah. Because when, when I read the scripture, I hear Paul and his writings. Okay? And Paul, he's, he's talking about, you know, that you need to be a good recreationalist for Christ. You know, that you need to, he says, endure hard recreation for Christ. Hmm. I think what he's talking about there is, you know, that, you know, sometimes it is, vacations are wear you out. Right? All the fun things we do, it wears us out. And when I read that, it says, endure hardness as a good soul. Right? It talks about us being more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Don't sound to me like a place for complacency. It sounds to me like it's a place for fighting, striving. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me tonight? The kids at, in, at the chapel, they love the song. They love the song that they, uh, Casual Christian. And Zach and Titus, no, Zach and. Uh, Who's going to sing with Keon? Zach and Keon were going to sing that today in chapel. And we just got ran out of time, but he's going to sing that casual Christian song. They love that song. I like that song too. But I don't want to be a casual Christian. I don't, I don't want to be one. I don't want to be one that just becomes complacent. Think that, I've, that I'm going to make it no matter what. Because we don't have no guarantee. I can hear some of you say, tell the Lord, Lord, open to me. Open to me. I'm sorry, I missed it. I was at a family reunion. I didn't know. Uh uh. Lord's coming. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I don't know. You know what? The Lord tells us that we should faith forsake not the assembling of ourselves together gives us a very strong warning about not missing that we should continue to assemble together and worship God right and he also says even much even more so as we see the day approaching I mean do we see that day approaching it's not time to lay out of church this time to be in church this is the time for us not to be complacent yeah yeah oh yeah there's those people that, that when they find out you're a Christian, they say, oh, I go to church. When you ask them what church they go to, unbelievable. But they go to Bethel Chapel. And here you come every time and you don't ever see them here. But it's their church. It's their church. I've had people call me and they were wanting help. And I said, well, you know, we try to help the ones that are here in the church. It's all we can do to kind of help them. They said, well, I go to your church. Really? I said, yes, and then they give me the wrong name of the church. They've, they've called so many. Can I tell you, it's not just where you go to church. But you need to be in the house of the Lord so that you don't grow complacent. Okay? Amen. Dear Jesus, I pray, God, that you'd help us. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd help each and every one of us. That we are continue to strive, Lord, to enter in. God, that we don't get to the point, Lord Jesus, we feel like we made it. Don't let us ever get to the place, Lord God, where we feel like we've got it sewed up. But Lord, I pray, God, help us to strive to enter in. Help us, Lord Jesus, not just because we know the Bible, not because we've taught, not because we've been taught, not because we preach, but Lord God, let us strive to enter into the, into the presence of God. Lord, I pray, do not let us grow complacent. God, let us continue to reach out and reach for souls and try to win the lost. 
Help us, God, to revive ourselves in the church and, God, to be to have a spirit of revival among us. Lord, even as we are ready for the coming of the Lord, help us to be ready for you, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. God, we pray. Amen. Church, would you come with me tonight? Let's come to this altar. Amen. Lord, help us not to be complacent. Help us not to be complacent. I want